wanting something, you're putting something, you're manipulating the angle somehow to reduce the intraocular pressure. So surgery is the last thing. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. And, and funny enough, most of you would expect that I will go and speak in details about the space classification or the Chandler's classification of, an, of gonioscopy. To be very honest, I don't use them at all in my practice. I need to know if the angle is open or closed and if it is closed, why is it closed? I look at the angle structures and obviously I'm looking always for the trabeculum because seeing the trabeculum tells you that the angle is open, not seeing the trabeculum tells you that the angle is closed. And I ask my fellows and residents to divide the eye into four quadrants and to describe in each quadrant, what do they see, specifically if they see the trabeculum or not. Now, I know that this is unorthodox, and I know that some people uh, look at the angle in a much more sophisticated way, but I'm a very pragmatic fellow, and I have not seen uh, a significant advantage in my practice to describe the angle in very complicated ways. So, to make it very simple, look for the trabeculum and see if it is open or not. Now, gonioscopy is of absolute importance, as we said, but also don't forget that we can do uh, simple tests prior to gonioscopy that can be helpful. Here you see uh, a very simple test, uh, the Van Herrick test, to try to find if there is a high chance of the angle being closed or open. Now, as you know, I will stop here. We look at the thickness of the cornea, and we compare it with the depth of the antechamber in the periphery. So you need to work with a very high, lum high luminosity of the trabeculum, of, sorry, of the slit lamp, and you have to use a very narrow slit. Does that replace gonioscopy? Of course not. But this is the minimum that I ask my residents and fellows to do in the uh, emergency room. So in, in the emergency outpatient clinic, Patients are coming and it is very difficult to ask every resident to do a, a gonioscopy for on every patient, but I ask them to absolutely do a Van Herrick test for every single patient. This is the only way in a very busy practice to capture cases where when the Van Herrick is positive, meaning that the thickness of the cornea is significantly higher than the, the depth of the T chamber. And if we find this, positivity of the Van Herrick, then we absolutely have to go and do a proper gonioscopy. And this will save you too many eyes. I remember cases that came into the emergency, they were examined, they had a conjunctivitis or whatever, they were treated, they went away, no Van Herrick was done, they come three, four years later blind because of a chronic anger closure glaucoma that was not detected. So this is of absolute importance. Again, this is another video rapidly showing you the Van Herrick, a very simple test that you can do uh, in an emergency uh, setting. Now, for the glaucoma consultation in Geneva, this Van Herrick is, is, is nice, but a gonioscopy is an absolute thing that has to be done. And it is not just done once, it is repeated at least once a year because the situation of the angle can change with time. Uh, and I would suggest that any privately practicing ophthalmologist would also put gonioscopy as part of his or her um, practice. This is the Goldman three mirror. And this is, of course, the legendary Han Hans Goldman, who was a professor of ophthalmology in Bern. A lot of what we are still using now is, are things that were introduced by Hans Goldman. But we stop here for a bit of a historic detour to tell you that Hans Goldman was never admitted as a member of the Swiss Ophthalmological Society. Why? Because Professor Vogt of the famous VKH, Vogt Honagi Hayada, was the professor in Zurich and he didn't like Hans Goldman that much. So he actually stopped him from becoming a member all his professional career. Two years before Goldman died and after he retired, Professor Franceschetti, who was the professor in Geneva, offered him an honorary membership of the 
Swiss Ophthalmological Society. So just imagine that the great, great Hans Goldman was not admitted as a member of a society. Remember these stories, because when you have uh, a day in your life when you somebody is cruel or somebody is not giving you your, your right, remember that very few people don't know about Goldman and very few people know anything about, about Fox besides being a name on a syndrome. Now, this is the uh, lens that I like to use for gonioscopy. It is a, I, I don't have any, in, in, any financial interest in all that. It is a Hagstrite called the CGAL, and it is my favorite lens because it really allows me to examine the eye in a, in a magnified way, and uh, I can make good videos and good films using this, this lens. Uh, some other people use the MagnaView, which is also uh, an interesting lens that I have tried. But again, this is my preferred one. This is the MagnaView. And of course, there is the uh, four mirror Zeiss lens uh, or whatever. I mean, uh, all, all uh, companies can do a four mirror lens and they are really good and they're very important. And, and it is not good enough to have a, a, a three mirror without having a four mirror. And I explain why. The four mirror allows you what we call the dynamic gonioscopy, using the lens itself to create changes in the antechamber, resulting in gathering of data that is of enormous importance. Now, imagine that this is a case where you put the four mirror and you look at uh, at the, the angle and you find the angle is absolutely closed. Now with a little bit of pressure in the center of the cornea with the former, you're going to push the aqueous to the periphery and thus either open the angle dynamically and find that the angle was just a positionally closed or you open and find a lot of synechia and then you find that it is actually organically or synechially closed. Again, to explain this, this is putting the four mirror, looking at the angle, which is absolutely closed here with a pupillary block, as you can see. And then we apply pressure with the lens. And once you apply pressure, you have two of, you have one of two scenarios. Either the angle is synechid and closed, so it doesn't open, or the angle opens when you put pressure. And that results, that explains that the angle is actually a positionally closed, but not in Sineke. A very short video to remind you that using the four mirror needs an enormous amount of sensitivity in your hands. So you are not supposed to push very much, otherwise the cornea will be totally corrugated and you will not be able to see well the angle. But so you have to be extremely sensitive as you use it to be able to catch and see the trabeculum if it is to be seen. Again, here is a video. I hope you can see that. With a little bit of pressure, we can see the angle deepening and we can see the trabeculum. Another video here. Uh, and this time we are trying to, to, to do that. And we can mo most interestingly see a double hump. So one hump here and the second hump here which pushes you into a potential diagnosis of a plateau iris syndrome. Now, UBMs are a fantastic ways to prove what you have seen with gonioscopy. Not everybody has a UBM, but I love to show this video because it shows you very clearly what is a pupillary block. And it reminds you that a pupillary block has been described by uh, nobody, none, none, else than von Graefe in 1862. So von Graefe without an ophthalmoscope, without a slit lamp, but basically with the sheer genius of his mind, he was able to describe the mechanism of pupillary block. Tells you something about thinking a lot about what you're doing and not accepting everything that is being told to you. So again, plateau iris syndrome with a UBM and the hallmark is actually looking at the ciliary body and seeing it rotating anteriorly and pushing the periphery of the iris. Young ophthalmologists always think that the plateau 
is this part when the true the, the the essence of the matter is that the plateau is this area here this is where you have the plateau not this so the ciliary body is rotated and you have a clear plateau formation which results in an anger closure again a uh, rapid uh, video to show you the difference between an unindented and an indented angle. I think this is, I'm stressing on this point because it is of paramount importance because this will dictate the decision that you take to your, for your patients. Will you, for example, an angle that is completely closed by synechia and the pressure is high, an iridotomy probably won't do much, but you'll probably have to do a trabeculectomy. But if the angle is appositionally closed, then there is a chance of opening it by doing an iridotomy, by removing the lens. There are many ways to open the angle, but it is very important to understand what we're dealing with before we go any further. Uh, often enough, we see uh, blood in Schlem's canal. And uh, I think this photo tells it all. Uh, you, of course, know, all of you, the differential diagnosis of blood in Schlem's canal, but I want to stress the fact that the most common cause of blood in Schlem's canal is you using the three mirror and pushing hard on the limbus, creating a reflux of blood into the Schlem's canal through the UV scleral outflow. Now, interestingly, the idea that is called the finger of gut Finger of gut basically is uh, this area where you have two lines of light collecting or meeting at Schwalbe's line. So it looks like a finger. And the whole idea of the corneal wedge, this area where the two light beams meet at Schwalbe's line, is that it helps you significantly to understand if the uh, if the trabeculum is visible or not, or if the angle is closed or not, because in not all trabeculum or all trabeculi are pigmented. So if you have a trabeculum that is very faint, it is absolutely possible to miss that it is present. For that reason, I depend completely on the corneal wedge to show me the uh, Schwalbe's line. Once I have identified where Schwalbe's line, I can easily know if the angle is open or not. Here you can see the corneal wedges behind the iris in a closed angle. Again, a case of closed angle, nothing uh, too fancy about that. And even dynamically, we are unable to open it. Pseudo-exfoliation syndrome is very important part of our practice because it is the most identifiable cause of glaucoma. Remember that primary open angle glaucoma, we don't have an etiological reason that is readily available. And remember that uh, agonioscopy is of a paramount importance in PEX, especially after you have removed the lens. This is the famous Sampaolesi line. This is uh, Roberto Sampaolesi, a very good friend of mine who I lost a couple of years ago. And this is Roberto and Juan Carlos, his son, in a meeting that I organized in Luxor 20 years ago. Um, Roberto was a very good friend and a mentor, and I really uh, miss a lot of wisdom that I've learned from him. Here is the famous Sampaolesi line, as you can see. This is really interesting if you have a case of pseudophagic patients and he has a, and, and you need to always do a gonioscopy because if you identify a pseudo exfoliation in the form of the Sampaolesi line, then you know for sure that you are treating a difficult disease. And it is not a primary open angle glaucoma. It is a sec, it is a vicious type of secondary anchor glaucoma that ends up with blindness if you don't take it seriously. And this is very different from a pigmentary glaucoma. Pigmentary glaucoma is a black or a dark band of pigmentation 360 degrees without, in most cases, a San Paolesi line and of a more or less the same degree of darkness at 360 degrees. 
And even before doing a gonioscopy, you can identify a pigmentary syndrome if you look clearly on the iris, all those black dots in a, in a light uh, iris is actually part of the syndrome. And you can sometimes in advanced cases, see the pigmentation on the periphery of the cornea even before doing a gonioscopy. Now let's speak a little bit about traumatic glaucoma and the role of uh, uh, gonioscopy in that. You need to identify areas where you have uh, an iris dialysis, for example, uh, and identify a recession. And remember that a case of hyphema uh, is associated with a recession in about 30% of cases. So 30% of traumatic hyphema are associated with a recession. Don't do a gonioscopy immediately while the hyphema is there, wait two or three or four weeks even before doing a gonioscopy to, to try to find the recession. Because otherwise you can restart the hyphema and, or, and make the eye re-bleed again. So it is very important to remember that this is something that we, we... And remember that anybody with a recession without an increase in intraocular pressure at this point might develop an increase in intraocular pressure years on. The, the longest record that I have seen in my clinic was a guy who was hit on his eye at the age of four and developed glaucoma because of recession unilaterally 63 years down the line. So when he was 67 years old, this is, sorry, this is a case of recession. You can see this gray zone. And this is even a better video that shows a massive recession taking about 90 degrees or even more of the angle. Now, cyclodialysis is also something that we need to identify. Here you have a case, and it is very important. Those are cases that are usually uh, associated with a degree of hypotony. And uh, just a, a video to show you how the ciliary body and the choroid detach, giving direct access to the aqueous into the suprachoroidal space, which basically results in hypotony. Here is another video where I would like you to concentrate on seeing this small cleft. Clefts are usually small, they're not that big. And I think this course is interesting because if you can keep the images in your mind, you will be able to clearly diagnose those cases. Here's another case, as you can see, of a ciliochoroidal cleft. And remember, those are oval-shaped openings uh, and they are not, they take one or two degrees, sorry, 10 degrees maybe, but not 90 degrees of the angle. Another case here. I hope I'm not bothering you with that. And then uh, how to manage those cases. There are many ways of managing these cases. This is one way of doing it, actually opening over the choroid and finding the exact hole uh, or the exact cleft, the ciliochoroidal cleft, as you can see, it's here. And then with a 10 O nylon, you can basically re-suture it and, and close it completely. Be in a, in a case like that, you will usually have hypotony. And once you repair it, be prepared to face uh, a, an attack of high pressure. So it is not as simple as we close it and everybody uh, lives happily ever after. Sometimes we then have to manage an, a spike in intraocular pressure. Small video again to show you uh, some pyramidal cyanike with, associated with a uveitis. So again, a secondary closed angle glaucoma. And here's a, a nice cyanike, which is easy to identify, associated with a recession of the angle. So I love this photo because it always reminds me, don't just accept the, ob the obvious. Sometimes there are something behind the obvious, as you can see here. Finally, a few words about glaucoma surgery. For those of you who do a deep sclerectomy, you know that we leave behind us a trabeculodesmets membrane. So this window that is actually closed, shut by the desmets membrane, 
And if the pressure becomes high, you can always go and gonioscopically do a goniopuncture, as easy as doing a, a capsulotomy, nothing too complicated. But mind you, don't be trigger happy. I don't perforate it, uh, you know, significantly in a fashion that will demolish the trabecular desmids membrane because what can happen is you will have an iris jumping into your intrascleral dissection, as you can see here. So again, a gonioscopic evaluation that shows a pupil that is over in shape and the iris that jumps in. Most of those cases, you will need to go in and correct what you see here surgically. Obviously, something like a goniotomy or uh, a kahook uh, dual blade is something that we do guided by, uh, by a, a direct gonioscopy, whatever lens you're happy to use. And here is managing or, or modifying the Schlems canal by injecting a hydrous implant into the, um, the Schlems canal, basically uh, doing a sort of a stent, uh, a stenting uh, of the Schlems canal. And uh, another procedure, which is the eye stent, where you are putting an implant or a tube into the supracoroidal space. Uh, all that, all different new types of surgeries, including the Zen implant, including many, many others, all depend basically on you having uh, a complete mastering of uh, gonioscopy. So uh, a practice where you are not doing a gonioscopy at least once a day is a, is a loss. Here is a Zen implant that actually eroded out of the conjunctiva. So we basically pick it up with a tying forceps, nothing too complicated, as you can see here. But is inter what is interesting in this case is the patient remained hypotenuse even after we removed the implant. And again, a gonioscopy gives you the clue. The implant left behind it a beautiful cyclochoroidal cleft that needed a revision surgically so that the patient again could have a, a normal pressure. There are fancy devices like this automated gonioscopy device that can show you the angle in, in, in many different aspects. Again, replacing a, a, a few hundred dollars lens with a few hundred, with tens of thousands of dollars of a device. I'm not sure at this point of time that the technology is worth the investment, but just for you to know, uh, one of the most interesting resources in ophthalmology is gonioscopy.org. Lee Alward, uh, a good friend, actually uh, curates this exceptionally good, uh, exceptionally good uh, website, and uh, I would refer you to that for further knowledge about gonioscopy. Um, the take-home messages are simple enough: gonioscopy is here to stay, and that it is your responsibility to offer a good gonioscopic evaluation to your patients and to motivate your colleagues and your students to learn the dark art of gonioscopy. And with that, I thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tariq, for this nice uh, presentation. And uh, um, although it was a short presentation, but it was concise, direct to the point, uh, full of information. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, I'll open now the discussion. We will start with uh, Dr. Qudih, if you have any uh, anything to add. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarek. I was, uh, this was very informative and I, I have learned uh, tremendously from your presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, what, what do you feel about uh, treating uh, cyclodialysis cleft with argon laser? Is, do you have any experience with that? And, um... Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I obviously showed you the surgical approach, but we, we start usually with atropinizing the patient, putting him on an atropine for a couple of two, three weeks. Uh, if that doesn't work, we, we try uh, argon laser or we, tr we sometimes also we try uh, basically cryotherapy uh, to try to induce an inflammation that would result into 
the choroid uh, sticking back to its place. I go to surgery only if those two options uh, have been depleted. So I'm not that scalpel happy that I would take the patient immediately to surgery once I see a cleft. And to be honest, even if you have a hypotonic maculopathy, there is a grace period of probably up to two months. So within those two months, the changes in the macula are usually reversible. So you can try and you can take your time trying to solve it in a non-surgical fashion if, if it is at all possible. Yeah, I found those very challenging, you know, in our glaucoma practice. You know, I, I, I did get a few throughout uh, the last 10 years of my practice. Uh, one of the most challenging ones is the one that, that plays tags with you. Like uh, one day that you see them with a pressure of two, and then the other day they come with a pressure of 40. So when you put them on atropine and steroid, they, uh, you know, they, they kind of, uh, you know, settle. Once you put them on anti glaucoma, uh, they, they settle and then their pressure go high. And then you put them on maybe sometimes one anti glaucoma medication and they're down to, to zero or two. So they fluctuate. Um, is there any, um, any point of uh, intervening surgically if they respond to medical treatment and not? If they, if they are responding to medical treatment and even if they are on the higher level, that buys you some time. It buys you some time and uh, the wisdom of patience and the wisdom of waiting for the body to correct itself is something that you get with age, obviously, and with your experience. Uh, but as you know, Qadir, in our practice, in our line of work, there's a lot of gut feeling and instincts involved together, obviously, with experience. Um, so I am always worried. Hypotony for me is a nightmare. Post-surgery, post-traumatic. I find that once the eye is hypotonous, it is vulnerable. It is vulnerable to everything. Sure. While if the pressure is high, I can always manage. I can always, there's something I can do. Worst case scenario, you can always do a paracentesis now and drop the pressure. So, but the hypotonies are nasty. So I wait, I give the eye its time. And if there is any medical response, uh, I am more than happy to give it its time. But to be very honest with you, my experience is slightly different than yours. My, in all the traumatic cases that I managed in Switzerland or in Egypt, I've always had uh, very bad luck with, uh, with, with medical, I mean, put them on, on, on st strong steroids or on atropine. I rarely manage to correct it, the, the situation without intervening with a laser or with a cryo or surgically. I mean, in my hands, uh, I have not been fortunate enough to be able to manage the pressure uh, and lift it up uh, medically. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So let's see if uh, any audience has a question. Um, Amir is asking, thank you very much. Have you faced uh, Uretz Zavalia syndrome after filtration surgery? In case yes, how did you manage it? I have rarely seen uh, the syndrome, uh, mostly because I'm using, uh, I'm, I'm doing deep sclerectomies uh, as my, cho my choice of, of, of filtering surgery. Uh, I am not a, a big on trabeculectomy except in rare cases. And uh, thus my complication rates over the years, thankfully uh, have been relatively low. Uh, but whenever you are facing a complication, uh, the, most, the best advice I can give you is try to understand the mechanism to reverse it. Uh, if, you, if you don't look at the etiology and if you do not understand the mechanism behind the pathology that you are facing, it is very difficult to manage. I don't know if Qadir has a, something to add to that. Uh, yes, uh, so in, in, uh, for the audience, I'm just gonna define Uretz Zovalia syndrome, which is basically loss of the pupil uh, function post-surgery. And this usually happens more often with, uh, with surgeries like uh, sometimes cataract surgery or 
uh, ICL implants, you know, when, uh, when you have a very high pressure post-op and you don't manage that pressure in a timely manner, that's where you get the loss of, uh, what happens is that the, uh, the pupil uh, sphincter uh, becomes ischemic and then you lose control and the patients become permanently dilated. It's a, it's a very devastating uh, complication. I have uh, seen uh, two in my practice in the last 10 years. And one of them was uh, post uh, ICL implant and the other one was, was after uh, just a, a routine cataract surgery. Uh, unfortunately, their pressure was high and it's, it was due to retain the viscoelastic material. So I would say the best way to avoid that is uh, very, very careful uh, first 24 hour to 48 hours pressure control. Uh, have a very uh, low threshold for uh, paracentesis if needed, putting patient on diamox, um, just managing the, that pressure in the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I have not seen this uh, after any glaucoma filtration procedure before. And luckily, um, you know, and, and Dr. Tarek, you know that, you know, uh, most of the time after glaucoma surgery, we always end up with a, with a honeymoon phase where we have a low pressure after filtration procedure. And then, you, yeah, you, and then you start uh, dealing with, uh, you know, healing issues uh, after a month. So I would say it's less common after uh, filtration procedure, but it's more common after uh, lens implant, uh, especially ICL. It's... Uh, I've not had, I've not seen it myself after a filtering procedure, but there was a report about post trabeculectomy developing a sort of a, a malignant glaucoma and resulting in an immobile pupil after. Some cases you can see that after uh, post-traumatic, if there is a damage to the blood supply to the sphincter, uh, notoriously you see that a, a dilated pupil, fixed dilated pupil after iridoplasty. And that's why a lot of people left iridoplasty and opt for a, a, a lens extraction and angle closure, even a clear lens extraction rather than doing an iridoplasty. But there was a period in our lives, maybe 10 years ago, when we did a lot of iridoplasty. And, and in those cases, we I've seen a couple of, uh, of uh, fixed dilated pupils that in some cases are reversible and in others they were, they, were, they were not reversible. And for those cases that were not reversible, the best option that we could do was to offer them uh, tinted uh, contact lenses. And I have seen reports also of a corneal tattooing to, to create a sort of an artificial uh, boundary against a glare for, from a, a fully dilated pupil. Yeah, there, there's a, a very weak evidence of the use of pilocarp heat up to six months, uh, but it's very poor response and uh, very few cases that uh, were treated using that. Uh, you know, basically, if they don't if they don't constrict, you know, after uh, their first week or so, they're likely not going to. Agree, and, uh, and and I agree with you that uh, you can have. Uh, less invasive treatments like a, um, like a shadowed contact lens or, uh, or a, co a cornea tattooing uh, or a pupil, pupil uh, circulage uh, procedure, which um, I would leave this to the, to the last. Absolutely, I totally agree. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, another question, I'm doing my master on, this is from Ruwaida. I'm doing my master degree on uh, PIX glaucoma. Any advices regarding gonioscopy in such cases as I'm studying their angle changes and glaucoma prevalence, special, um, any, any special resources? Is that related to PEX glaucoma? Yes. PEX glaucoma. Yes. Um, I think uh, looking at PECs from a gonioscopic standpoint is, is very interesting. I remember that there was a study that I read many years ago 
that actually could not correlate the amount of pigmentation to the severity of intraocular pressure. It always looked to me as counterintuitive. I always thought that the denser the pigmentation that probably will have a higher pressure. But I don't think, but, but the published reports were absolutely against that. So my advice to Rwaida is to uh, retackle this issue. Maybe you should try to uh, create your own system of recording and evaluating pigmentation and to try to correlate that with intraocular pressure. I think that would be very interesting. Also remember that in pseudophagic patients, you can find uh, PEX material on the IOL. And I think that is, is, is quite interesting to, to observe and to document uh, in, in your studies. Um, we know that PEX is associated with, uh, with very high degrees of intraocular pressure fluctuations. Um, and uh, we know that pseudo exfoliation uh, can be better controlled after a phaco emulsification, not because we're taking out the lens, but probably because the phaco uh, energy affects the trabeculum in a way that it clears it. And there are some trials. I think that my very uh, dear friend and mentor, Andre Mermou, uh, published a report on a device that he attaches to the phaco uh, tip to try to clear the PEX material from the angle. And I would suggest that you take a look at that under Mermou, M-E-R-M-O-U-D and, and PEX on PubMed or Medline, you will be able to find that. I hope that that is some advice that I can, uh, that the advice that I'm giving uh, proves to be useful and all the best of luck in your masters. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. Uh, this is uh, a question from Dr. Ali. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tariq, for this nice presentation. If you noted very severe and increased pigmentation in the angle in PDS with pre-glaucoma or, or early glaucoma, are, uh, do you prefer to do PI or not? Yes, that's a clear yes. Uh, there is a paper that I have worked on for years that has 250 people with pigmentary syndrome, and we, we actually randomized them to PI versus no PI. And we could clearly see if the patient is in a pigmentary syndrome state and you do a PI, the chances that you would convert into pigmentary glaucoma is much lower if you do a PI. But if the patient is already with a pigmentary glaucoma and you do a PI, it doesn't change much. Uh, unfortunately, this is lying somewhere in a drawer here. I haven't yet uh, published it, but I can give you this unpublished data that is statistically uh, very well uh, examined and proven that a PI in pigmentary syndrome is useful. And I have uh, loads of, of, of young doctors in the university hospital here with pigmentary syndrome that I have perforated myself and have been following for more than 15 years. None of them, none of them have developed a pigmentary glaucoma. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. Uh, another question from Sufyan. Um, if you can please re-explain the, the classification, your classification of angle as open or close, Dr. Tariq. It is not can you re-explain? Yeah. Yeah, it is not my classification. It is a universal classification of glaucoma that basically divides the angle into three potential uh, categories. An open angle where you see the trabeculum, a closed angle when you do not see the trabeculum, or a dysgenetic angle usually seen with congenital cases where the angle is not fully formed. Once you identify the angle as open or closed, your job is to try to find if it is primary opening, op primary open angle or primary closed angle, or if there's a reason behind it. So it's a secondary, secondary open angle like pseudo exfoliation, like pigmentary glaucoma, or and, and uh, secondary angle closure, like phacomorphic glaucoma, like phacodinesis, like, uh, uh, uveitic glaucoma, like uh, having uh, a tumor behind uh, in, a, in the ciliary body, for example, uh, like malignant glaucoma, all those are different types of secondary uh, closed angle glaucoma. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. A question from Federico. 
what is your experience doing trabeculoplasty and what type of lens do you recommend? Uh, trabeculoplasty, I am using a selective laser trabeculoplasty. I'm very, um, I'm actually very enthusiastic about selective laser trabeculoplasty and I think it's a very intelligent choice. If I develop glaucoma today, God forbid, I would go for a selective laser uh, prior to going for uh, a, a, a topical medication like a prostaglandin or a beta blocker. I am using uh, a four mirror fast SLT lens. I don't know if I have it. Uh, if you can hold on one second, exactly. I think I have it in my pocket. Yeah, one. So this is actually the lens that I'm using. You can, I don't know if you can see it. It's a four mirror lens that allows for a very fast SLT. So I don't have to move it. I can do an SLT treatment very rapidly. And by the way, as we are here, I also show you the Hagstrite lens. I don't know if this is in focus or not, but this is an adapted Hagstrite lens that was done uh, with a smaller optical zones, but I can also do a dynamic gonioscopy with it. And this is really, these are my two of my best friends. Great. And uh, another question from Anis. Thank you for the nice presentation. Can we put a trabeculence if we have a hypotony with choroidal detachment post-surgery post -surgery of of trabeculectomy to reduce filtration and rise the IOP to manage the choroidal detachment. What uh, is that tuberculence? What is that trabeculence? I have no idea. To be very honest, I, 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 a hypotony after a trabeculectomy can be, again, you are thinking of a solution without thinking of the reason behind it. Why do we have a hypotony after a trabeculectomy? In most cases, we have a, a hypotony because of overfiltration. So it's either overfiltration, meaning that you have a lot of aqueous going into the subconjunctival filtering bleb, which is usually associated with a high big bleb uh, and hypotony, or you can have a leakage of the wound in the form of a positive side. So rather than going for a... a, a fancy ways of trying to increase the pressure, let's find out why we, the pressure is low and treated. So a leakage needs to be closed. You close the wound in the right way. Even, even a few days after the operation or a week or two, you can take him again and close it if it is, doesn't close by itself. Overfiltration, there are many ways of handling overfiltration. You can do a revision of surgery, opening and closing tighter your flap, or there are also uh, reports, one study that was published by Norbert Pfeiffer from Mainz in Germany, Norbert actually did a transconjunctival closure of the flap. So he actually took stitches through the conjunctiva, taking a bite into the flap and tightening it. So there are different ways, but I, I would always try to identify why the problem is there and then go for a solution rather than trying to find the solution without a clear idea about why the problem is there. Great, now um, Anis has answered the question that I, I raised. What is that trabeculence? Um, the answer is, it is a contact lens with a high diameter. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a basically a high corneal diameter lens that you put to try to close the, 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 the leak, the sidal positive. Yeah, it can work in, in temporarily, but and, and in some cases it will help healing happening as you are pressing on the conjunctiva. Uh, so it could be a solution. I use it sometimes, I have to say, but if it doesn't work, then you have to revise the wound. Okay, a question from 
Muhammad, uh, how do you diagnose? Ah, sorry, Dr. Khudeh, please. No, I was just going, uh, uh, going to say, I, I do use a, a con an oversized contact lens. Uh, that's, I think, what he meant by trabecular lens. If I have a leakage uh, through, through the limbus, like uh, when the conjunctiva meets the limbus, sometimes there will be a small uh, gap there that uh, leaking. I, I don't feel uh, too worried about that because uh, using a contact lens for a week or two sometimes is enough to induce more inflammation and fibrosis. And then uh, most of the time I don't have to go back to the OR and, and stitch them. Uh, but I do be, I, I will be more, more, much more concerned about uh, a side dial that's not at the limbal uh, site, uh, more higher than that one. You may want to go back and uh, stitch it if, uh, if it is too. Uh, uh, I agree. It is very rare that I have to take a patient back to the operating room to uh, close a wound. Even if I have a side dial, I will be patient and wait a little bit. Uh, but my worry, Qudeh, uh, is more related to uh, a sidal positive happening four or five years after the operation. Those oh, are yeah. usually associated with bad blebs. Those yeah. can be a precursor for a blebitis or endophthalmitis, and I never take those lightly. I take them very seriously. Any bad bleb that is leaking with a hypotony, I definitely take into the operating room. I definitely revise. I excise a blab, I reconstruct a blab, but I never accept a bad blab. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think we're seeing less and less of this since the uh, concentration of mitomycin C uh, has become less than when, when uh, like let's say 20, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I think, uh, like I'm using 0.2%, uh, I don't know what the, I, I, I beg to differ, and I tell you why. Mm. Uh, I'm using 0.28 milligram per milliliter, so not very different from you. But a lot of our practices related to use of mitomycin have been spearheaded by more fields. And uh, recently, in meetings where I was invited to speak with Keith Barton and with Penko, they have promoted, they have been promoting the idea, I think, at least Penko, I'm not sure about Keith, but there was a lot of promotion of idea of a 0.5 milligram per milliliter. Mm -hmm. So a significantly higher mitomycin concentration. And I am using this opportunity to caution against the use of high concentrations. It is going to become fashionable very soon. And unfortunately, uh, your wishful thinking Will, will turn to be a, a nightmare when you will see your colleagues using a 0.5 and then you will have to manage the complications associated with that. Yes. Agreed. Okay, perfect. Um, Mohammed asks, how do you diagnose malignant glaucoma with gonioscopy? Uh, malignant glaucoma is something that you uh, need to be very careful uh, about and try to catch it as fast as possible uh, because it is devastating and it can result in a significantly higher intraocular pressure. Now, the most reliable thing that you have to remember is if you do a gonioscopy, the angle will be closed. Okay, that is easy enough. But the depth of the anterior chamber is shallow all over. In a pupillary block, you will find the anterior chamber deep in the center and shallow in the periphery. In malignant glaucoma, you will find the shallowness all over, whether you are talking about the center or the periphery, the angle is completely shallow. Pressure is always very high. Uh, one thing that can, you can do that can help here is a UBM because it can show you a rotation of the ciliary body associated with uh, a malignant glaucoma. Those the history is very important. Those happen in cases that are hypermetropic and uh, you need a lot of luck to manage those cases. Uh, you need to try to break the hyaloid with a YAG if you can. And if that doesn't work after obviously atropinizing the patients, then you can, you, you'll have to do a vitrectomy. Uh, it is a very, very nasty kind of uh, complication. Uh, comes only second to suprachoroidal hemorrhage in, in, in my opinion. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. 
any uh, any comment, Dr. Rakudeh? Uh, no, I, I totally agree with Dr. Tark. It's one of the nightmares, you know, to see. Uh, one thing that I'm just going to tell the audience that uh, with malignant glaucoma, even though it says malignant glaucoma, sometimes you'd be surprised it's not with the high pressure sometimes. It would be with even with the normal pressure. So that's uh, just something to keep in the back of your head. Uh, if, you're, if you see a shallow anterior chamber, everything is squished uh, forward and you do a B scan and then uh, nothing to see, no choroidals, nothing. And then you keep in mind and the pressure will be, let's say eight or 10. So don't exclude the malignant glaucoma. It still can be the case and uh, you wanna manage it that way. Yeah, very interesting. Because what we know is malignant glaucoma is very high pressure. Yeah, you would think it's very high, but I have seen it with even with an eight pressure. And it's still but, the, 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 I also have seen it with low pressures, but uh, this is usually a malignant glaucoma happening after a trabeculectomy. So the eye is in a hypotonic state and then it develops the, the malignant glaucoma. So it goes from a zero to eight and eight is eightfold what it was after the operation. Yes, exactly. But, uh, I've never seen a malignant glaucoma with such a pressure if there was no filtration, excessive filtration happening. Mm. True, yes. I agree. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, um, it seems that uh, there is there are two paradoxical uh, statements. Uh, some somebody is is asking whether look over the hill or don't look over the hill. The question is: during gonioscopy, do you ask the patient to look towards the mirror you are looking at, or to look straight ahead? That's a brilliant question. Brilliant. And uh, it is something that I have struggled with when I started my, my uh, residency. And I have learned, I've been told opposite opinions. Okay. So some of my mentors use this, some of my mentors use the other way. But I tell you what I do. I personally ask the patient to look at the mirror and I do not diagnose a closed angle from looking straight ahead. And that is a matter of experience and a matter of style of, of doing things. Uh, but more important than where the patient is looking is the fact that the room has to be dark and the ray of light should not go into the pupil. This is, this is much more important than where the patient is looking. If you manage those, I think I am always asking the patient to look towards the angle because I think if, you, if the patient is looking straight ahead, we are probably missing a lot of open angles and, and diagnosing them as closed. I don't know if Qudir has a, 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 a different opinion that I will always obviously respect. Yeah, no, no, I, I do the same, exactly, exactly the same. And I, I, one other thing is I, I, I try to use the smallest beam that I would allow me to see uh, to avoid yeah. a pupil constriction and artificially opening the angle. Exactly. And by smallest, we mean narrow and we mean short. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Muhammad, uh, thanks, Dr. Tariq, for this fruitful lecture. My question is an inflammatory glaucoma. Sometimes there will be ciliary shutdown and we will give steroids to, uh, for treatment. And then after that, there will be a spike of high pressure. So uh, how we can know uh, when to stop giving the steroids and start the anti-glaucoma? My, my, my simple answer is that you are, that we are doctors and not engineers. We do not deal with two and two equals four. And, and I always tell my patients, uh, complications can happen because I'm not building a, a, a pyramid based on specific blueprints. So there's a lot of uh, give and take and trial and error with every patient which has his own or her own story and her, her or his own circumstances. Uh, you give steroids and you try to figure out slowly if the pressure is going up because of the steroid induction or because of the pressure being high, irrelevant 
of the steroid. There's no real guidance for that. And I tell you a case where I had a patient, a young Turkish boy who was 10, and he developed a hyphema because of a golf ball hitting his eyes. And this guy had a hyphema. He was put on steroids. The pressure was 40. He was sent from Turkey for surgery. And I was not really convinced that the, re the recession or the inflammation could push the patient into 40. Uh, and I was, I, I resisted operating day after day, giving him super maximal treatment of, of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And only after like a week of struggling and the pressure from my fellows to take the patient on to, into the operating room and after stopping steroids, the pressure normalized. So this is a case where you have to, to judge what you are seeing, try to get all the small details about if there's really inflammation. Uh, a steroid induced uh, uh, pressure rise is usually an eye that is relatively quiet. And because of the steroids and because of microscopic changes in the trabeculum, the pressure goes high because the outflow facility is significantly increased. So you see nothing but high pressure. While if it is not related to steroids, you usually see uh, uh, some other signs that are available like inflammation, hyphema, something like that. But that is as, as, as best as I can tell you. And in between this scenario and that scenario, there is all the different colors of the spectrum. So uh, it's, a, it's a trial and error. It's a matter of practice. It's a matter of uh, if the pressure is high, can you stop the steroids and control it topically and wait and see? The problem is if you have a pressure uh, after stopping the steroids of 40 with maximal medical therapy, including diamox, and you don't really know, is the pressure going to go down or um, do I have to do an operation that will do a irreversible damage and in some cases might end up with a hypotony. So best advice that I can give you, if you have the worst case scenario, you have a, a child, let's say with a pressure of 50, you've stopped the steroids for two weeks, the pressure is high, you gave him Diamox, everything, everything that you can give and still the pressure is high and the optic nerve starts to suffer, I would go for a tube which is something that I don't like to do a lot, especially in children, but on the, on the idea that an evolved tube like the Ahmed, if the pressure goes down, will shut so that the patient will not develop a, 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 an issue with the hypotony, whether, but if you do a trabeculectomy and the pressure normalizes, you can end up with a trabeculectomy. This is my way of thinking. There's no right and wrong here. Uh, but but this is the best advice that I can give you. I hope this is useful in any way. Okay, uh, great uh, answer, uh, Dr. Tariq. Um, I'd like to hear the answer from Dr. Kudeh as well. Uh, well, <clears throat> mashallah, Dr. Tariq covered everything. Uh, just uh, uh, for Muhammad Jassim, I would say uh, if you do have this uh, kind of uh, you know a ciliary shutdown and then. Uh, and then you put them on steroid and the pressure goes up. Uh, I would recommend a couple of things that uh, try to avoid prostaglandin just as a pro-inflammatory uh, agent. And I would also uh, not uh, stop the steroid right away. Maybe uh, have an overlap period uh, where, where you uh, taper the steroid slowly and introduce the anti-glaucoma uh, medication slowly so that you don't end up with a shutdown again. Um, and again, as Dr. Tarek said, this is like uh, something that, uh, you know, with patients, you never, there are so many variables, so many uh, ways that people respond to different medication. Uh, for example, I have a patient who would develop ciliary shutdown sometimes even from an SLT, like they're very responsive, like they, anything that you do to them, they, they just shut down. They, they just have this uh, inflammatory reaction where they... Uh, they well, whatever you do, they they will they will develop that ciliary body shutdown, and and sometimes very hard to get them uh, up again. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's it's yeah. I, I would do an overlap period between the two anti-inflammatory and anti-glaucoma, and I would try to avoid prostaglandin. Those are my two cents. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have just three questions more. How do you manage plateau iris syndrome in young patients? Do you recommend laser iridoplasty? 
I'm not uh, very big on, on, on iridoplasty these days because of the potential for uh, a dilated pupil afterwards. Uh, you see, a plateau iris syndrome, first of all, is never uh, isolated, almost never isolated from pupillary block. So I will start always with an iridotomy to take away the, the potential for a, a pupillary block. This is always my first step. Second, you have to weigh the risk and benefit for this patient from all levels. Is he actually, is this plateau associated with high pressure or not? This is, this is very, very important. If the pressure is not high, and even if there is a plateau, we can observe. But if the pressure is high, and if the, uh, and if the optic nerve starts to suffer, then the difficult question would be, would you do a clear, clean, clear lens extraction or not? Uh, taking in consideration that removing a clear lens for a young person would have obviously refractive issues. And uh, second, the operation is not that easy, to be honest. But I think that if a person develops glaucoma after an iridotomy with an iris plateau, even if the angle is, is closed, even if the lens is clear, in a young patient, my best bet would be to do a, a FACO and remove the lens because mainly because the person is young and because we need to invest in a, in a courageous decision that will protect his eyes for the 60, 70 years to come. Yeah, very interesting. So in this case, I respect the clear lens extraction as a refractive surgeon because I am always against this operation amongst amongst refractive sur uh, surgeons, because many, many refractive surgeons, they rush to this. Um, sometimes the patient is a candidate for LASIK or a candidate for uh, SMILE, femtosmile, and they do clear lens extraction. So of course, this is not related to the, to the lecture, but just like um, to, to, uh, to highlight this point that it's, clear it's lens extraction- it is, it is maybe not, specifically related to the, to the lecture, but it is really, really important. And I join you in uh, disliking a clear lens extraction in a young person, except if we are in the corner, except if we're really cornered and doing it for something that is, has nothing to do with refraction. Yeah, perfect. And um, now there is a wonder, wonderful question actually uh, from Ziad. What's your clinic protocol regarding cleaning the gonioscopy lens, especially now with COVID? How do you clean the lens between patients? Uh, we have two solutions. For people like I, who are very uh, old fashioned with their lenses, we, I, I actually, after using the lens, I have a solution prepared by the hospital that is protective for the lens. I throw it in a, it's a small box, like, a, like a, a cup, something like that. You put the lens there for 30 seconds and then you put it in BSS and it is ready to be used. And this is a solution that has a very low concentration of chloroxidine. That is what the hospital is doing. But for the uh, residents, uh, that are uh, not uh, used to, to lenses like, like the CGAL or something like that. We have invested in uh, disposable lenses. So we buy disposable lenses, we give them to the residents, they use them once and then they throw them away for iridotomies, for iridoplasty, for gonioscopy. Uh, any, any lens that has a contact now in the hospital is starting with the COVID situation. So a year ago, or more than a year ago, we started using um, uh, disposable lenses. And the quality is good, to be honest. Hmm, interesting. Dr. Kudai, how do you clean the lenses? Yeah, uh, similar. We uh, like uh, clean thoroughly with uh, alcohol uh, wipes, and then after that with the chlorhexidine wipes, and uh, let them dry uh, completely if, uh, to avoid the corneal burn. Um, and uh, in the hospital, we actually send them for sterilization, like autoclave. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, in, in my private office, I just use uh, alcohol and chlorhexidine. Oh, great. Yeah. So I'll take now the last two questions because now uh, I think it's too late. Um, 
one one question is uh, somebody is using the machine that you mentioned earlier which is the digital gonioscopy and um, the uh, the question is is it more efficient than the manual with method or less efficient dr tariq it all depends on who's using this and who's using that <laughs> i mean i think in, in in an experienced observer's hand a gonioscopic lens is much better than anything that is automated uh but again you know it's like it's like the oct for 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 uh, optic nerve evaluation uh it is a very good tool for the general ophthalmologist but i still think that looking at the optic disc and the retinal nerve fiber layer for an experienced observer is is probably as good as an oct uh it, it all depends on you know, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it depends on your experience level, on uh, uh, why are you using this device? For, so to, to make it very simple, gonioscopy is a cheap and very effective way of doing that. This machine has future, but not among ophthalmologists, in my opinion. In my opinion, in very soon, we will have machines like that in areas where we can screen people. So imagine a device that can do anterior segment evaluation, gonioscopic evaluation, and posterior segment OCT that will be put in some place where a patient will put his head and then through artificial intelligence will be able to find out if this patient is a high, high, has a high predisposition to certain eye diseases. And, and uh, then he or she can be referred for a, for a real assessment. I don't see uh, automated gonioscopy replacing regular gonioscopy for the ophthalmologist and definitely not for the glaucoma specialist. But for aut automated uh, remote evaluation of patients, I'm 100% sure that this is where we're headed. Yeah, great. Now, uh, in this regard, I would say the following uh, that always when we have uh, two options the first one is subjective by ourselves we are doing the evaluation by ourselves and the other one is objective by a machine subjective is much better than objective the objective is just supportive maybe to give you some indices maybe to highlight some some points but it will never replace the sub subjective evaluation and um, I can um, say that this is something similar to the retinoscopy for uh, the uh, measurement of refraction. Even if you have an autorefractometer, a, a very advanced one, it cannot replace the very good skillful retinoscopy, especially in children. And I still depend on retinoscopy. I do it myself, the re retinoscopy despite uh, uh, in spite of having the autoref uh, measurements so if you have manual gonioscopy and the uh, the digital one um, depending although also i'm not a glaucoma specialist and uh, i am now among uh, giants but for myself i will never depend on the digital one as long as i can do a skillful manual uh, one um, do you, do you agree with me, Dr. Yes. Tariq and Dr. Kudeh? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, not to mention that uh, keeping the skills, like uh, if you're always going to depend on what the picture is going to show you, you're going to lose that uh, kind of skill which you can carry with you wherever you go. You, may, you might be working in a rural area where you don't have access to that. So I would, I would definitely uh, stick with the, with the manual. Uh, now for the lens that I use... Uh, I'm not privileged to have hog stripe like uh, Dr. Tarek, but uh, I will look into that. I do use uh, the six mirror from Volk. I, I found it very helpful where you don't have to rotate. And it's also a dynamic or indentation gonioscopy lens where you can push on the cornea and do the indentation gonioscopy. Um, I found it very easy to use, very, uh, uh, have a very short uh, learning curve and um, handy, but uh, in, in comparison to hard stripe, I don't know. Uh, have you tried the six mirror, Dr. 
No, no. I haven't used the text mirror. I actually they never heard it existed even. So <laughs> I'm out learning something new. I, I use the I use the form mirror, I use the Magna view, I use the Hug Stride CGAL, uh, and different uh, types of different versions of a, of a, a three mirror. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of industry into that having Hug Stride in, in Switzerland, but uh, I've never used the six mirror to be honest. Yeah, the six mirror allow you to see everything without rotating, so you don't scratch the cornea or have the patient being uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, yeah. I am a fan, though, of uh, hog strike. Uh, everything from hog strike is a <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> he is, yeah. Uh, great. Uh, the last question now is, uh, uh, is Magna, Magna View superior to the three mirror Goldman lens? This is one part. The other part, finding the meeting point between the anterior and posterior corneal reflection is not uh, always easy to me. Any advice, please? Yeah. Okay. Magna view is probably uh, superior to a three mirror, but in my opinion, is not superior to the CGAL uh, from Hagstride, but it's a, it's a very nice lens. Uh, uh, the corneal wedge is done by using very high intensity or high intensity of light and using an extremely thin, narrow beam. This is the only way that you can see it with high magnification. So you put your, your slit lamp on a high magnification, you use the right corneal lens, and you have a high intensity of light and a very narrow beam. This is the right way. And don't try to find it by having the, uh, the beam of light coaxial on the trabeculum. You have to move it to the right or the left to be able to find the light falling with an angle to be able to see the corneal wedge. Okay, perfect. Now, there is a, a question. Uh, do you allow me to ask you, Dr. Tariq? Yes, I know that, that uh, both of you, Dr. Tariq and Dr. Qudayh, are treasures. So, uh, one last question. With pleasure. Thank you. Are laser parameters of SLT laser the same for uh, PEX uh, primary open angle glaucoma and pigmentary glaucoma. Uh, usually, the uh, when you are uh, treating a pigmented angle, as in PEX or PIG, you reduce the power uh, of, uh, of of your uh, of your uh, SLT. Uh, I usually start with 0.9 millijoule. Uh, but I would start with even 0.7 or 0.8 when I'm doing a PEX. Uh, and usually the recommendation is you hit till you see a, uh, the champagne bubbles and then you reduce your energy till you not don't see it. Well, this is the manufacturers, uh, most of the manufacturers, and I've actually tried every single SLT device in the market only recently because we were buying a new one to the university. And they all recommend that you see the bubbles then go 0.1 milli millijoule less then the energy where you sew the bubbles and then continue doing 360 degrees. I don't do 180 degrees anymore. I always do 360 degrees for SLT. Mm. Do you repeat the SLT, Dr. Tarek? Only once in rare cases, but uh, it all depends. Uh, my, my SLTs are usually reserved for uh, primary treatment, even before putting... Uh, uh, you know, uh, topical medications, or in desperate cases where the patient absolutely refuses to go into the operating theater and he has already four molecules. So I, I, I do an SLT not hoping for much. I rarely find good surprises, but my, my best indication is when you diagnose the case, go for an SLT before you put topical medication. Obviously, if the patient agrees and if the patient finds that, uh, something uh, finds it as a, as a good idea. Okay, fantastic. So now we came to the end of the session. It was very interesting, very informative. I'd like to thank both of you, Dr. Tariq and Dr. Qudeh, uh, for the very fruitful discussion. And hopefully we can one day meet in person, inshallah. In one, day soon. one day soon, one day soon, inshallah in the future, inshallah, near future, inshallah. And I'd like to thank the audience for being with us 
And uh, we hope to see you next month with a new session as well in this series. Thank you. Thanks Thank again. You. And Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.